Hey, good morning, church family and guests. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us today. I so wish I was there, and I'm going to be there soon. In fact, my hope is to be back with you uh, next Sunday. I sure hope so. Grateful for our team, our preachers, and the whole crew that have done such a great job in my absence. Hey, I wanted to speak into a couple things, and the first is this new series that we're entering into. Uh, You've seen that we're going to be walking through the Psalms this summer, and little did I know some months ago when I planned this series for us that uh, I would walk through what I've been through in recent weeks. It's interesting to me because of all that God has been teaching me through this time is what I'm hopeful that we'll learn as a church family. Um, Walter Brueggemann breaks down, theologian, breaks down the the Psalms in three ways. He talks about a psalm of orientation. There's a category of psalms that are what he says are, are psalms of orientation. That is to say that everything in life is kind of aligned. It's all good. It's when you know the sun is shining and, and all things are right. You may be going through a season like that in your life. Things are really going well. I think of Psalm 100, you know, gosh, worship the Lord, enter to his gates with thanksgiving. All is good. God is good. Let's worship him. There's a lot of psalms that are like that and uh, because sometimes seasons of life are like that. He talks about psalms of reorientation, which is when you go through a really tough time and you're questioning God, the psalmist is crying out to God. And then there's some kind of resolution where he actually says, you know what, I thought this and I've been going through this challenge, but now I see what God is doing. And he turns a corner, he starts to worship God uh, because a lot of life is that way. Uh, Then he talks about the psalms of disorientation. These are the most challenging psalms and the most challenging seasons of life. And I can tell you that I've experienced this to some degree. Um, A psalm of disorientation is when things are disoriented, when life is not going well. And throughout the psalm itself, there's no resolve. There's no resolution. He's crying out to God. He's in trouble. This is often David. And uh, praise God for David's vulnerability, his honesty, and his openness because he talks about times when he's just crying out to God. He doesn't see an answer. We're going to look at some psalms like that because sometimes life is that way. In fact, I would argue that a lot of life is that way, where you sense that your prayers are not reaching God, where you don't hear from Him. And I can tell you that through a couple of weeks, um, a couple of weeks ago, where I was going through some real severe pain and questioning as to why at this time this would happen to me, I felt disoriented. I, I didn't really understand, God, why would you interrupt my life this way? Um, and... Uh, And I've come to really understand in new ways that I'm looking forward to share with you that we can worship God through those times. Because in that space, in that place of disorientation, two things can show up. In this environment of of disorientation, of a life interrupted, a place of of questioning, even suffering and pain, and it could be physical or emotional uh, pain, um, one of two things can show up. Either faith... You say, God, I know you're at work. I can't see it, but I know who you are, and I can trust you. Or real uh, fear, um, maybe distrust, even anger can show up. And all those are appropriate. God is big enough to handle all that stuff that we might want to bring to him. Um, But one of those things are going to show up in that space. And, And the psalmist teaches us how we can really, truly worship God in times of disorientation and times of pain and suffering. So I'm grateful for the things that God's been teaching me anew in these days, and I look forward to sharing those uh, with you and um, with our whole church family. So today we're going to dive in, and you're going to be blessed as we look at Psalm 1. And uh, I want us also, as a church family, as we journey together through the summer, I wanted us all to read the Psalms together as it speaks to us, and it's going to bless your life. So you have a reading plan that you received today in the bulletin. You can go online and find it as well, and you can look at our app, and it's there. So anywhere you are this summer, stay on course, disciplined every day to walk with the Psalms through us, uh, with us together. Next week, I'll be back to be with you as we worship God through every season of the soul this summer. As Jeff talked about the seasons of the soul... Maybe you feel like you're in a season of dryness. Maybe for you, you feel like you're in a season of what he said, disorientation. For you, maybe withering spiritually. You see it happen and you're like, man, I want to be close to you, God, but I feel like I am distant. What's going on? Anybody anybody ever been there before, by the way? Maybe if you're there now, anybody ever felt like, 
What's going on in my life? I feel like I am distant, farther from God, withering, not the way that life is supposed to go. I've been there before. Uh, Eight years ago, I was in one of those seasons in my own life where I felt like I was withering on the vine, literally. The, 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 the words we'll read here in Psalms chapter 1 of a, of a tree that's fruitful and its leaves do not wither. I, I was like, really, God? Like, I don't, I don't see that happening in my life right now. I, I felt like everything I tried to do outwardly didn't get what was going on inside fixed. Maybe you're there right now. What happened for me during that season is I, I went and I sat down with a guy who was mentoring me. His name was Jim. And Jim said, Sam, now he's sitting in a chair at Starbucks, but Jim said, hey, I, I want to show you what's changed that for me, Jim said. And Jim, what he did is he transported me from the stair- chair at Starbucks to his chair in his living room at home. Now, I think it is kind of funny that the stage is set up for outdoor stuff. And yes, I did bring in a living room chair on stage today, but that's VBS. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and he said, Sam, I, I, want, I want to show you, I want to show you what gives me life. Now, this was big. I was listening. You know why? Because as I was watching Jim's life, it was the opposite of a life that I felt was withering. Like his life was extremely fruitful. As, as I watched the way that Jim lived, and even as I would spend time with Jim, I saw that Jim had something inside of him that I really wanted. And really, I had tasted many times in my past, but I wasn't experiencing it then. And Jim said, if you want your life to be different, it's going to be what happens in your chair at home every day. And so Jim showed me what he did in his chair. Now, as I thought about this sermon, I thought it'd be really cool if I could bring Jim here, but I'm going to do something even cooler, okay? I'm going to let the Word of God, the psalmist, tell you what Jim told me that day. Y'all ready? I I want you to jump in with me to Psalms chapter 1. If you're in a season that you really feel like you're, you're withering, or maybe you're not there, but you've been there before, that could be coming. How, how do you move from a season of withering to a season of, we're going to use this other word, that's uh, it's a much cooler word than I am typically, flourishing. A word flourishing. Here we go. This is what Psalms chapter 1 tells us. Are you there? Are you there? Watch what the psalmist writes. He said, blessed, verse 1, chapter 1 of Psalms. Now, if, if the, the Bible's new to you and, and you're just pulling, up, uh, pulling out a Bible, really kind of, it's, it's in the middle, right? If you didn't find it, it took you a while, it's kind of in the middle. Mine's a little bit farther towards the, the beginning for Psalms chapter 1. And, and if you don't have a, a hard copy Bible with you, you can find it online. But what, read with me the words here of Psalms chapter 1. He says, blessed, blessed is the man. The word there, blessed, it's the same word that you see Jesus say in the New Testament, beatitudes. And when you translate this Hebrew word into the Greek or even the Aramaic, which Jesus may have been speaking, that like they're, they're trying to say the same thing. And this word for blessed, maybe you've heard it talked about before, it's a deep-rooted inner happiness. The Bible will often say similar with the word joy. And it's the opposite of having a life that feels like it's withering from the inside out. It's a life that's flourishing from the inside out. And we're going to look at what this flourishing person doesn't do, what he does, and what he looks like. And then we're going to look at what withering people look like and what they do and they don't do because that's what Psalms chapter 1 tells us okay so this this flourishing person the blessed man is the one who doesn't do something watch what he doesn't do flourishing people don't walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the way of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers now what is he saying? He's, he's saying here that, that the, if, if someone is going to be blessed, if someone's going to be flourishing, there's something that they are not doing in their life, and that is that they are walking with the world. That's telling them, that's speaking to them 
evil and not maybe not even doesn't even look evil but it's things that on the outside may look good but it's not in line with scripture he says there's people who you could walk with that are going to give you counsel they're going to speak into your life and it's not going to be good but notice the progressive state of stationariness in this there's a walking there's a standing i'm not even moving now i'm standing and then there's a sitting that's going on in that person's life, and it's the wrong chair, right? And, and believe me, I sit in this chair all the time, and so do you. When we, in our own lives, sit down and we start listening to what the world has to say to us, and it may even look good on the outside, that's ultimately going to lead us to withering, not flourishing. Uh, it happens when we, we sit down, right, and we listen to Dr. Phil on TV because we think he knows all the right answers. Or maybe we know he doesn't know all the right answers, but we still listen to him. It, it, it happens when we maybe we're sitting in our car and we're listening to, to music all the time. And I, believe me, I love country, but some country is not cool, right? Some, like, but that's all that's coming into our, our chair is in the counsel of the wicked. And he says, if you want to be a flourishing person, you don't do that, he says. See, flourishing people, they don't. They don't sit their lives there. And it's almost a marination going on. I don't know if y'all like to grow meat, right? What, what, what is it that you are placing your life in that's starting to soak in to you, right? Marinating your life there. They, flourishing people don't do that with the world. Verse 2, flourishing people do something. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates, it says, day and night. I'll read it again. His delight is in the law of the Lord. The word there for delight is literally to desire or to, to take pleasure in. It's, it's like the, 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 the newlywed that's really wanting to, it's really pursuing really wants to be close to that other person all the time right until about four hours into their honeymoon right and they somehow get over the, the, the delight the, maybe for you it's a hobby you feel yourself really marinating your life in football and all you're reading right now is about the Dallas Cowboys and what's coming next year and you're thinking if we can just get another pass rusher it's going to be a great season and your, your, your life is really, but the, 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 uh, this, this is flourishing people do this with God's word. The law here would have been the first five books of the Old Testament. Have you ever tried to delight in Leviticus? <laughs> like this is David, what he's able to delight in. Now he, there's a gracious God that, 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 that has come and he's brought his people out of slavery. So there's grace in Exodus, right? It's there. There's a, a loving God that creates man to walk with him. But, but David is able to go to the law and he delights in it. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. And watch, watch. He delights in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates. He's sitting on something. He, he, he's placing his life in the word of God, day and night. This is where he marinates. We'll talk more about that word here, meditate, in a little bit. This is what a flourishing person does. Now watch what he looks like, verse 3. He is like a tree. Now, conveniently, the theme for VBS is helping us out right now. Okay, we got trees all over the stage. Okay, but, but where do trees grow? Trees grow where there is water, right? And, and David is noting this. Watch, he is like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, I'm going to show you a picture here. Have you all ever been in, a, in an area where there's not much water coming down from the sky and you see water? This is, this is a tree that's planted by a stream of water in the desert. And, and, and when you see, well, like this is an oasis is what they call that, right? Because the, 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 the trees that are going to flourish and bear fruit and really grow at all are planted by something and it's 
water. Now, what is he equating the water to here? It's, it's the law of the Lord in which he's marinating his life. That's what he's equating the water to. He says he's like a tree that's planted by streams of water, yields its fruit in season. Now, this is actually helpful for all the animals around it. It's not a self-focused thing. It's regenerating. When someone's life is flourishing, people around them are being blessed by it like I was by my friend Jim. He bears its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. The opposite of wither flourishes, and all that he does prospers. Well, that's where we want to be, right? We'll come back to that in a little bit because we want to do what the psalm writer tells us and my friend Jim told me that we need to do in order to flourish. But watch, keep going in the psalm. He's going to show us now withering people. Verse 4, he shows us what they look like. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Y'all say chaff with me. One, two, three, chaff. One more time, chaff. That's just a weird word. It's kind of fun to say. Kids, you know what chaff is? Maybe kids don't know what chaff is. Chaff is the dead plant, the dead leaves, the dead things that are around the grain. When, the, in the, in, in, when, when you would be in Israel, people, kids would grow up seeing this, so you'd know what it was if you were a kid in Israel. The, the, the wheat would grow, but what you wanted was not the whole plant, so you'd cut the plant down right? You cut the plant down, but you still wanted to get the grain. You wanted to get the fruit. You wanted to get the helpful stuff out of that dead plant. So you know what you do? You cut it down, and the plant would literally wither. The plant would literally wither, and the, and the, the leaves would wither. And it would be at that season, actually, the end where it's a harvest season, where the plant itself was basically dead already. And they take it, and they would do something that's called threshing. I'll show you a picture. Here's a picture of someone threshing. And they would take that plant after cutting it down, and they throw it up in the sky. And what happens is they throw it up. The wind would catch it. And it would pull away all of that dead, withering plant. And the grain, the good fruit, would fall right down at the base of where they're throwing that stuff up in the sky. So they would be able to separate the withering, dead plant that was not helpful from the fruit that they wanted. And he is saying, for the wicked person, the withering person, they are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Why? Because they are not rooted anymore, right? They, they're not grounded in the water. They can't, right? That, that, that part of the plant now is useless and it is removed. And in our lives and in my life eight years ago and at many other times, I've sensed myself going this direction, which is really no direction at all. When I find myself marinating in the advice of the world, I get pushed any direct, like it's like a, a being blown one way and another way and another way, seeking, trying to find how am I going to satisfy what's missing on the inside. And he said, that's what withering people look like. They're like chaff that the wind will just blow one way or the other. That's what they look like. Look what they're not doing. And actually, as we look at these next two verses, it's a little bit more future tense than what we've read so far. But watch what he says. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Commentary writers disagree on what, what this is actually referring to. But if you look at the context of the whole psalm, I think it's thinking about the opinion of, the judgment of other people. If you're marinating your life in the counsel of the wicked, the way of the sinner, the seat of the scoffer, and you're trying to earn approval in the eyes of the world, you're not going to stand when they're judging, will you? No, because everyone has a different opinion. Now, this could also refer to the end, and we'll talk about this in a second, the other way to translate it, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Again, another group that it doesn't work for this kind of a person to be at church all the time because they're looking and they're watching what other people have and they're thinking, how do they I have that and I don't? And it's, it's this, they're, they're seeking actually instead of really going to what will give life giving water to their soul, the Word of God. They're trying to figure it out and find it in the approval of others. Verse 6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of... Here's the thing they do. You want to see what they do? 
they perish. (laughs) The ones who are withering, the ones whose life is not rooted in, the ones who are finding their real direction in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of the sinner, sitting in the seat of the scoffer, you know what they do? They do nothing of eternal significance. There's no fruit. They perish. Doesn't sound like fun, does it? Now, the other way to translate or to interpret verse 5 and 6 is is to to think that this psalm writer is actually talking about the very end. And we're going to see this throughout the the book of Psalms. We're going to see the gospel really shown to us in the Old Testament, which is pretty cool. We're we're, we're going to see the theme of creation. We're going to see the theme of the fall and our sin, which is all over this passage. And then we're going to see the the theme of redemption and restoration, which we also get to see early on in this passage. Those who are rooting their life in this gracious, giving God, where they can go sit their life in that chair, marinate in, delight in, find their life in as they meditate on the Word of God. We're going to see this theme play out, but I, I, want to, I want to tell you, if you're new here today and you've never really heard it, here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible shows us that we're all sinners. We're a mess. We've fallen short of the glory of God. We saw it beautifully depicted in my brother's life over here, Kurt, today, as he got in the water and he said, as we were talking earlier, I mean, we talked about sin in his life, like has been in mine and everyone here in this room, Right? And what God does is he shows us that he loves us by sending his son, a descendant of the great psalm writer David, who didn't write all of this book, we'll see, but a lot of it, to come and die for you and me. And you and I get to find not just life here and now, but eternal life by rooting our life in him by grace through faith in Christ. And we're going to see, even before Jesus, one of his great, 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 great grandfathers, right, show us that in this book. And so that we can stand when judgment ultimately comes and we will not perish eternally. So as you look at those two, the flourishing person, the withering person, what would really more describe your life now? Maybe you see a little bit of both. How can we move from either today or at one season maybe that you'll face in your life from a season of withering to a season of flourishing? Well, the psalm writer tells us, right? We touched on it earlier. The psalm writer tells us. And it's right in line with what we see all over Scripture. Here's another place in Scripture. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This is a big commission being given to the people as they're moving into the promised land. You know what it says? It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Does that sound familiar? He's, He's basically telling the people, You need to find a chair where you can place your life in the Word of God, marinating there, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Sound like verse 3 is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. His leaf does not wither, and all that he does prospers. You want to do this? All right, let's, 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 let's wrestle with the two things he tells us that the that the person who is flourishing does first delight in. Okay, I'm going to, the rest of my time here, I'm going to just give you some ideas that you can take to your chair back home, okay? I, I, I want you to, I'm going to, I want to ask you really even this question. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to, I'm going to push this chair up towards the stage. And I want to ask every person here, because church, if you are a Jesus believer, that guess what? Jesus didn't just come and leave. Jesus came, he gave you the Holy Spirit to be your counselor and teacher, and he's given us a love letter to guide our lives, right? And so I'm going to ask you this question, where's your chair, right? Where's your chair? Bill Hybels, who's an outstanding communicator, he asked this question in one of his talks about, I guess it's now 10 years ago, I didn't hear it until after my friend Jim told me about what he did in his chair, and I was like, this is like, yeah, this is what I needed to hear in my season of withering. Where's your chair? Are you doing these things? The first, again, delight, delight. Are you finding any time to delight 
in Scripture. I think sometimes we think of maybe if you've grown up in church, quiet time as intimidating. We think of it maybe as a important thing that I know I should do, but we, we delighting in. Maybe you think of this whole book as I have thought much of my life about uh, what I joked about earlier, um, Leviticus. This book may intimidate you. This, 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 the thought of going to it and actually delighting in it may be foreign. Or maybe for you right now, you're in a season of withering and you have delighted in it before, but you've forgotten how to do it. Here's, here, here's, here's a few thoughts. A few thoughts towards delighting in the Word of God. My wife needs a cup of coffee. Is that okay? Is it okay to say you need a cup of coffee? My wife needs a cup of coffee. So she'll have her table side. We have, we have by the way, a, a couple of chairs in our living room. And we're, we're usually doing this in the evenings right now. You, oh, you, you saw the, my favorite part about this chair. I need my feet to be up. Okay? Now that, that may sound weird. But I, I love that. Okay, we have these two little chairs that don't even look like recliners in our living room. But the, my chair's feet, for some reason. Now, now this might sounds like I'm trying to be lazy. Okay, but and that, the, now this, this sounds like, whoa, what? Okay, I enjoy, I enjoy sitting down in my chair. My wife has her cup of coffee. I've got my feet up. Sometimes I actually pull blankets out because she likes it like 30 below in her house at night. Okay. <laughs> And, and, and this is weird. It sounds like a non-man na- thing to say, but I, I basically snuggle up into a time with God, right? And that's something I can look forward to. That's something. I, now, another thing that a lot of people need in order to delight in the Word of God is a specific time of day. It's interesting. He says day and night in verse two. Some of us, it doesn't work if we do it in the morning, right? All you want to do is. Be grouchy with God, which David does in Psalms. It's okay. So, some, of us, some of it, I, I actually asked Holly, uh, I asked Justin if I could show Holly's journal. Look here, is it, do you even know this was coming? I told Justin. I'm going to show you a picture here. Uh, this, this is Holly journaling on Psalms chapter 1 this week. Okay, this is a new thing girls do, I guess. I would, that mine would look very much not as cool as that, okay? It's, very, it's pretty, Kahali. It's pretty. That, that is pretty. It's a unique way to connect with God and even to lo- delight in Scripture. I don't know what it would look like for you, but to find a way where it, it again, I, I related it to romance earlier. I, I related it to a drive to pursue like college football. Here's Psalms chapter 16, verse 11 says this. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You want to get a glimpse of what it looks like? I want to invite you to show up for a second at VBS this week. You know what VBS is? It's like this week-long thing of figuring out ways to delight in the Word of God. Many of you are going to be here leading kids. Many of you kids in this room are going to be here, and it's fun. There's videos around Scripture. There's games around Scripture. There's crafts around Scripture. There's even snacks around Scripture. We're, We're going to figure out ways to make Scripture taste good in our own lives and delight in it. It's a beautiful thing. What does that look like for you? Where's your chair? Is, is your chair right now at the office and you're trying to cram a 15-minute Bible reading time in and it's not enjoyable? Where could you go to make this time sweet? The writer of Psalms says that those who are flourishing, they delight in. And watch, not just delight in, but they meditate on. Now this word meditate on is what we'll talk about the rest of our time here. Meditating on, this, this meditating on is, is it's this continuation of this thought of marination in some ways. It literally could be translated as internal groaning. And as you look at commentary writers, what they think this word was really communicating is meditation is the act of taking something in, but not letting it just come in, but speaking it back to yourself with a low internal groan over and over and over again. It's not just 
reading the Word of God. It's letting the Word of God read you. It, it's, it's, it would be like trying to eat without swallowing if you don't meditate, right? If you just, like some, you've heard people say, in one ear and out the other, that happens in our lives if we're not intentional about catching it and saying, oh, God, I see that. That's pretty. It's good. I want to digest it, and I want to bring it into my life. Psalms chapter 19 says this. 119, excuse me, a long one, by the way. He talks about, if you want to, you want to get excited about reading the Word of God, read Psalm 119, and you're going to do that this summer because we've got a reading plan for you. He talks about meditating over and over and over in Psalm 119. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Are you doing that? Where's your chair? Are you finding time to let the Word of God be what is marinating your life? A few beautiful quotes. Charles Spurgeon said this, Oh, to be bathed in a text of Scripture and to let it be sucked up in your very soul till it saturates your heart. Isn't that pretty? Martin Luther said, For some years now I've read through the Bible twice a year. If you picture the Bible to be a mighty tree and every word a little branch, I have shaken every one of these branches because I wanted to know what it was and what it meant. Two men that bore fruit in incredible ways, who were meditating on Scripture. So how do you do that? Well, if, you've, you've, if you know where there's a chair, we have three questions in our church, and these are the three questions, by the way, that my friend Jim, Jim gave me eight years ago. He didn't word them the same way, but they were the same questions. Okay, The three questions in our church, do you all remember the three measures for our church? The first question is, what is God saying to me. I hear a lot of you saying, what is God saying to me? I want you all to say this with me. What is God saying to me? Again, this question is to drive us to not let it just go in one ear and out the other. And so if, if you are, and I'm going to pull out right now, if you've got a bulletin, I want you to grab the bulletin. I want you to pull out this little Psalms bookmark here. You heard uh, Pastor Jeff mention this a, min a minute ago, but this, this Psalms bookmark is meant for you to have a reading plan. But what I want to challenge you to do in your chair is not just have the opportunity to read Scripture, which is very good, but to really ask the question, God, what are you saying to me as I am reading Scripture? Okay, Because hear this, when Jim spoke this into my life eight years ago, what I was doing is just trying to cram a Bible reading time in at one point. And it was not catching between, I, I, I meet with guys here in the room, one of them is nodding at me right now, who are doing this. And God's speaking, so what, what you do is you stop and you say, God, what are you saying to me? One of the disciplines that can maybe help you get this is to actually rewrite a verse that has jumped out to you in your own words. Because what you're doing is you're, you're forcing yourself to really see what the Bible says. And you ask the question, what is it saying? The second question that we ask in our church measure is, how will I, do you all know it? How will I obey? How will I obey? Cultural Christianity, and Jim, my friend, said this is what changed it all for him. What changed his life of feeling distant from God to really saying, I'm going to take a step of obedience in response to my time in the chair. He said, now I can look back at my journal that I wrote in the chair and I can see how God has directed my life as a leader in my organization. Every day he's leading me to do something new and different. I can see how he's affected my marriage because I'm not just sitting there thinking that's good theology. I'm hearing God actually Direct my life as I seek to live in response to him. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus every day as we marinate our lives in the word of God and we let him direct us to a life of flourishing. So what is God saying to me? How will I obey? And then the third is what? Who will I tell? This is what leads us to be a tree that bears fruit. This is what leads us to not just be something that looks healthy on the outside and we have something going on on the inside, but we're able to go to people and we're able to say, hey, guess what? God showed something to me in my chair. We're able to be like Jim 
and say, hey, there's a, there, in this, even the, for the secular world church, this is an exciting conversation. To not say, you don't start out with saying, hey, you're going to hell. You start out by saying, guess what God showed me this morning? And guess how my life is changing in response to that? And you're engaging in that conversation with this super exciting watching someone else here nod in the room that I've seen this so clearly in their life. When this man is in the word of God, his life is on fire, right? And then when he's distant, he feels dry, right? When he's in it, he's on fire. And guys, I want this for you. Jim wanted it for me. So my question for you is, where is your chair? Where's your chair? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Y'all pray with me real quick. I want you to think. Think of what, what, what specific thing has God said to you today that may be jumping out in your mind. If, if you're in a season of flourishing or if you're in a season of withering, what, what, what are you seeing in Psalm chapter 1 that may, may be... That what, this? Oh, wow, that, that, that jumped out. What is it you feel like God is saying to you? And maybe you've heard people say all of your life that, man, you should read the Bible. That's not something God wants from you. It's something God wants for you. This is a love letter seeking to speak into your life so that you can be led to a life that's flourishing. So where's your chair? I want you to, to, to right now, I want you to, to, to make a point to take and apply. Maybe for you, it's just finding a spot to start to read. If you're reading, maybe for you, it's starting to write it out in your own words, a verse that jumps out to you. Maybe for you, it's pushing yourself past the theology to hear the application. What is it for you? Where's your chair? What would your life really be like if every day you were marinated in Scripture? What would our church look like if every person here? God, I pray in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit for a flourishing people. And you've told us how. You've shown us how. Through this beautiful song that was written some 3,000 years ago, you've showed us how we can be like trees planted by streams of water that bear their fruit in season, the leaf did not wither, that all that they would do would prosper. You've showed us how, and I pray that every person here would be able to answer this question, where's my chair? That we would marinate our lives in what you've given us through your word. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.